Well, good morning and welcome to Catalina Foothills Church. My name is John Stone. I'm the pastor here. And on behalf of the uh, session, the deacons and our staff, we're really grateful that you're here and we want to welcome you here. Especially if this is your first time with us or you just recently started attending, we want to especially welcome you and invite you to meet one of our greeters if you have not, because we have a gift for you we'd love to give you, and we're just thankful you're here. If you are a member or a guest, you, please know that there is a part of this bulletin you can tear off and communicate with us. You can give us your information. We would love to get together with you, to get to know you, to have coffee, to grab lunch, or just hang out so you can get to know more about us and we can get to know more about you. And also, if you need prayer, you can list prayers for us every week, our staff, our session, our deacons, our leadership, and our prayer chain prays for the prayer requests you give, and we would love to pray with and for you in your hour of need or in your victory or whatever may be going on. So don't feel free to do these and then put them in our offering plates. I'm asking this. We're still not passing the offering plates. I don't know when we'll start doing that. But there, those plates where you can put these in are where you enter and exit the sanctuary. Well, we've gathered here today not only to worship, but to meet Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ invites us into his presence. He invites us to be his disciples. He invites us to know him because he is the only place and the only person that can give us rest. And we hope this morning as we come to worship, as we give our hearts and minds to worship, that we'll enter into that rest that Jesus Christ offers to us, not only in himself, but in the work he's done for us on the cross. And we hope that as we gather in that rest, we'll keep reminding you of that, reminding you that in fact, Jesus loves you, has given his life for you, and he invites you to love him back. And we hope that if we'll rest and we'll remind, that then we will reflect that to a world that is longing for that. The interesting thing about being a Christian is even in the midst of people turning against Christians and turning against Christianity, we have the answer they long for and the only answer they long for. And we want to reflect that good news wherever we go. So as we enter into worship today, we would invite you to rest, to remind, and reflect. Let's prepare now for worship. stand with me for the call to worship. It comes from Psalm 92. It is good to praise the Lord and make music to your name, O Most High. Magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. Let us pray. Father, we come to you, the one who has made us and the one who knows us, to offer ourselves to you and to worship you. We want to give our entire beings to you, all of our thoughts, all of our emotions, and all of our lives, because you alone are worthy of that. And so we come to you and ask that wherever we are today, whether we come sick, or whether we come healed, whether we come full of faith, or whether we come full of questions, whether we come knowing while we're here, or whether we come not knowing while we're here, we come to you and ask that you would meet us, and that you would make us more like your son. We thank you that you invite us to worship. We thank you that when we pray, uh, when we sing, when we meditate, when we hear you meet us. So meet us now and make us more like your son, Jesus Christ, because we come to worship him and we pray this in his name. Amen. Let's remain standing as we sing together. Charles Wesley, on the anniversary of his new birth in Christ, wrote this hymn, Oh, for a thousand let it be what is coming from your heart as you remember what God has done for you. Oh, for a thousand tongues to 
To the King of the Ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. splendor of light that God dwells in. We're told in Scripture that He dwells in unapproachable light. When it's reflected on us, reveals something other than light. Whenever we come and worship, we come and meet the beauty and the glory of God, but we bring to that worship ourselves, and we're sinners. And part of what we do in worship is we confess our sin. We don't confess our sin to make ourselves feel guilty. We don't confess our sin to make ourselves feel shameful. We confess our sins because we can, because God stands ready and he loves to forgive us. And it's an invitation, it's a blessing to come into God's presence and to admit who we really are so that not only can we admit who we are, but we can receive what he is, a God of grace and mercy. So Christians, I would ask you today, 
What is your confession of sin? We have feared and trembled before men while we have not feared you, Lord. We have rejoiced in idols that will not last while we grow impatient with you for not meeting our expectations. We have been captivated by entertainment rather than your glory, Lord God Almighty. We have become consumed with consuming, though Christ poured out his own blood to buy us for himself. Holy Spirit, convict us. Jesus, mediate for us. Father, hear us and forgive us as we confess our sins to you. Lord, hear now our silent confessions of sin. We offer these prayers to you, Jesus, in your own name. Amen. Christians, lift up your heads and hear these words from God's word about the compassion and the forgiveness that we have in our brother Jesus. In Isaiah 43, 25, it says, I, even I, am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake and remembers your sins no more. Christians, you are forgiven because of the work of Jesus Christ. The Lord loves to forgive his people. Therefore, let us rise and sing his praise. He will hold me fast. It really comes right out of John chapter 10, where Jesus says, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. I am the Father of the Lord. I've asked the Lord to sing the opening verse, and then I'll invite you to sing it with the Lord.
He will hold me fast. He will hold me fast. <laughs> He'll even give me a good mic when I need it. <laughs> That's faith. That song is faith. He will hold me fast. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for and the conviction of things not seen. Praise God. Let us now, Christian, answer this question. What is your confession of faith? For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, the intelligence of the intelligent, I will frustrate. We believe that Christ crucified is the heart of the gospel, a suddenly brought to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those who God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. You may be seated.
Good morning. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Please join me in prayer. It has been a long week. Our lives are often feel rushed and overwhelmed with constant responsibilities and needs that press for our attention. There might be very little time we commonly set aside for rest and renewal in God's presence. And yet, his word is so clear on how important it is to establish the priority of worship and Sabbath into our week. We need you now more than ever. We ask that you would direct our hearts and minds towards you and fill us with your spirit, bringing refreshing, renewal, peace, and joy. You remind us in your word that you are faithful to carry out our burdens. You tell us that you will renew our strength, and you promise to give us rest as we come to you. We thank you, Father, that you are with us in whatever situation we are in. We pray for protection of our lives, our families, and other believers. We ask for your hand to cover us and keep us distant from the evil intent of the enemy. Calm the fear in our hearts, no matter how difficult things become. We ask that you lead us through this time of spiritual confusion and public incivility. Give us courage to confront those things that compromise our thinking and threaten our integrity. We pray that you would give us discernment and insight beyond our years to understand your will, hear your voice, and know your ways. We are grateful for the blessings of healings and prayers recently answered. We confess our continued need for you today and every day. We need your healing and your grace. Bless our congregation. Heal those who are ill and recovering. Reassure those who are fretting about the future and comfort those who are grieving. Thank you for your mighty power that extends to all that love you. We pray for those not in attendance today that are streaming or traveling. Continue to watch over and to protect them. We pray for healing in our country and for the triumph over ungodliness nationwide. We pray for our elected officials and those in authority at the city, the state, and at federal levels that they would seek your will and make decisions that lift up our nation. We pray for our all the men and women currently serving worldwide in the military. We ask that you would continue to watch over and protect them. And finally, we lift up Pastor Stone as he prepares to bring the message that you have placed on his heart. Let everything said today be divinely orchestrated. Amen. Well, it's good to be back with you this morning. Uh, I'm going to lead us in a few announcements before we turn to our text in our life together. Uh, the first one is that on Saturday, April the 24th from 6 to 8 p.m. here in our sanctuary, we'll have Seth Gruber, who is a voice for the unborn. He's really excellent, especially if you have folks who really wonder why do Christians take the stance we do around being pro-life and the unborn it would be a great opportunity for you to bring them and hear Seth talk, and it'll be really encouraging to you. We invite you to come out and be a part of that. And secondly, coming up on Monday, May the 17th, we have the Golden Luncheon. This takes place from 11.30 to 1 p.m. This is honoring our women with 80 years of faithfulness, wisdom, and beauty. And uh, I got to attend this last year, and it's truly beautiful. If you would like to come, you need to RSVP. RSVP by Monday, May the 9th, by calling the church. The only way to RSVP by this is to call the church. So you see that number there? We'd love to have you. If you need a ride or if you need someone to pick you up, let us know and we will serve you in that way. Also coming up on May 1st is our city serve. We have a number of slots still available. Everything from painting and landscaping to assembling food boxes or making greeting cards for the elderly. Some activities are off campus, some will happen here, but there's something for everyone, so please sign up today. One of our goals, and you're going to hear me say this over and over, is that when people talk about this church, they would say, well, what's going on at Catalina Fiddles Church? I, I, they may say, I don't know what's going on, I just know that they're everywhere. 
part of what it Part of what Christians want to do is spread out in their city and love their city. And this is a practical way for us to go and love our city. And finally, uh, the, the new event flyer is in the seat back in front of you. So a lot of people want a, a fuller idea than just our uh, bulletin of what's going on. So there should be a flyer in front of you. If not, you can pick them up in the back. But we will be publishing those to keep you up to date. And that's our announcement today. Let me take just a brief moment and thank you as a congregation, as friends, for your prayers for me as Marissa and I and all of our children went back along with my brother and his children to bury my dad. It was a very sweet time. It was a very wonderful time. And, uh, and this is the advice I would give you as you think about the day when you will pass along. You're like, John, I didn't come here to think about that. It was... A blessing, my dad would have wanted a light and happy funeral, and we we were able to give that. But unexpectedly, for me at least, a good number of his employees showed up. My dad ran a district, about 12 counties for the state of South Carolina, the last 17 years of his life as a forester. And my dad sort of, you know my dad, I, I talked about the good words he spoke of me. Some of the probably, you know, friction between my dad and I resolved around these words. Son, why can't you just do what I ask you to do? (laughs) And I understand that. That was more me than my brother. Interestingly enough, and remember this, you might need to go tell your children some true things about yourself. A gentleman showed up there I'd never met and said, hey, John, it's just an honor to come be with here be with you here today on on the day your dad's being buried. It was a beautiful ceremony. He goes, your dad was the first boss ever had and the best boss ever had. I said, well, tell me about that. He said, well, John, the best thing about your dad is we would get directives from Columbia, South Carolina, which was the headquarters of the Forestry Commission. And this is back when we all got mail and he would sit in our staff meeting, he would open them and he would say, that's not for us. And he was throwing under. And I turned, to his, I turned to his casket and said, doggone it, I was you. Like, see, <laughs> son, why can't you just do what I asked? Dad, why can't you just do what they asked? <laughs> be careful. Be careful. Because you don't know who will show up at your funeral and sell you down the river. So uh, <laughs> it, was a, it was a truly beautiful day. We buried him about a mile and a half from where he grew up, and the Lord met us, and it was really great, and I really appreciate your prayers. Uh, we're working our way through 1 uh, Corinthians. We come to 1 Corinthians 7. Just a side note in defense of Chad Turner. Someone asked me, someone asked me this week, why does Chad only preach on sex? <laughs> so most of you are aware of this. We're just picking a book. We're working straight through it. I... Chad got assigned that text on incest earlier in Corinthians. I was supposed to be here last week, but my dad decided that Chad would have to do that text. <laughs> and so that, that's not on Chad. We just worked straight through these books, and I'm thankful that he took it on. I listened to the sermon. I was encouraged. I appreciate it. I hope it was edifying to you, but that's not the only thing Chad can preach on. So in defense of Chad Turner. <laughs> Interestingly enough, Paul is going to continue to talk about sexuality in our chapter today. So it was a very long chapter. I'm not reading all of it. There's no intentionality in skipping it. If you think, I know the pastor skipped this verse, email me. We'll talk about it. I'm not skipping any verse in text. You just can't preach on the entire chapter today. So 1 Corinthians 7, beginning in verse 1, it says, Now for the matters you wrote about, it is good for a man not to have sexual relations with a woman. But since sexual immorality is occurring, each man should have sexual relations with his own wife and each woman with her own husband. The husband should fulfill his marital duty to his wife and likewise the wife to her husband. The wife does not have authority over her own body but yields it to her husband. In the same way, the husband does not have authority over his own body but yields it to his wife. Do not deprive each other except by mutual consent and for a time so that you may devote yourselves to prayer then come, together, then come together again so that Satan will not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. I say this as a concession, not as a command. I wish that you were as I am, but each of you has his own gift from God. One has this gift, another has that. Now, to the unmarried and to the widows, I say, 
it is good for them to stay unmarried as I do. But if they cannot control them, they'll control themselves, they should marry, for it is better to marry than burn with passion. To the married I give this command, not I, but the Lord. A wife must not separate from her husband, but if she does, she must remain unmarried or else be reconciled to her husband. And a husband must not divorce his wife. To the rest I say this, I, not the Lord. If, if any brother has a wife who is not a believer and she's willing to live with him, he must not divorce her. And if a woman has a husband who is not a believer and he is willing to live with her, she must not divorce him. For the unbelieving husband has been sanctified through his wife, and the unbelieving wife has been sanctified through her believing husband. Otherwise, your children would be unclean, but as it is, they are holy. But if the unbeliever leaves, let it be so. The brother or sister is not bound in such circumstances. God has called us to live in peace. How do you know, wife, whether you will save your husband? Or how do you know, husband, whether you will save your wife? Now, dropping down to verse 29. What I mean, brothers and sisters, is that the time is short. From now on, those who have wives should live as if they do not. Those who mourn as if they did not. Those who are happy as if they were not. Those who buy something as if it were not theirs to keep. Those who use the things of the world as if not engrossed in them. For this world in its present form is passing away. I would like you to be free from concern. An unmarried man is concerned about the Lord's affairs, how he can please the Lord, but a married man is concerned about the affairs of this world, how he can please his wife, and his interests are divided. An unmarried woman or virgin is concerned about the Lord's affairs. Her aim is to be devoted to the Lord in both body and spirit. But a married woman is concerned about the affairs of this world, how she can please her husband. I'm saying this for your own good, not to restrict you, but that you may live in a right way in an undivided devotion to the Lord. Amen. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of God stands forever. Let's pray and ask God to teach us his word. Lord, open our eyes now that we would behold marvelous things in your word. Be our teacher and our guide in this. Uh, these are really beautiful things Paul talks about, and yet there's many things here and complicated things. So, Give us sort of grace in this and mercy to understand, especially give me grace and mercy that my words would reflect your words. Would you use the preaching of your word to help us be more like Christ? And we pray this for your name's sake. Amen. So, so as we open up chapter 7 in 1 Corinthians, something is drastically changing here. So in the first six chapters, as we look at 1 Corinthians 1, 1 through 6, Paul is talking about things there that he's heard. In fact, we're told early in the book that someone from Cleo's household has come and told him a number of things that are transpiring in the church. And so for those first six chapters, Paul is telling them what he knows, and he's, he's sort of addressing these issues, like that issue of incest, the issue of division in the church, and there's several issues. But in chapter 7, something changes, and that is he stops dealing with those questions or those concerns that have been brought to him by Cleo's household. And he's now addressing a series of questions that the Corinthian church has sent to him. So what we have is a difference, not in Paul's teaching, not in the authority of scripture, but a difference in what Paul is doing. And so if you're reading the book, and I hope you are, you can feel that change because it goes from being pretty smooth to being pretty rough because he starts sort of in a bullet point way answering these questions from I have heard to you've asked me. Now, it's, it's very important that as we come to chapter seven, that we recognize the culture that he's speaking into. So this culture would have been sexually unchained in a way that even ours is not. And I really mean that. So if you're older, you may feel this, that it feels like our world is more sexually lost and more sexually open. And that's certainly true. But it probably, our culture still fails in comparison to what was going on in Corinth. In Corinth, they had temples where in part the way they worshipped was to have sex with a prostitute. This was the way they offered their bodies and their emotions and their minds to God. And so everyone who's addressed here in the Corinth church, who was especially, who was a non-Christian, who was converted, had participated in this form of worship. Most certainly all of them did. 
In fact, it was well known in that day that there was a term, and I can't pronounce it because I'll mispronounce it so badly in the Greek, but it's basically Corinthian, la, 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 whatever. And it meant, and you would say, to live, like, to live a Corinthian life. And that meant a wild and unhindered and sexually open life. The term Corinthian girl was a commonly used reference for prostitutes in that day. So as Paul goes to write this letter, and the, one of the reasons he's talking at such length about sexuality is because he's speaking to a church that wasn't really founded from the Jewish synagogue, but was founded from a pagan culture that practiced open marriage, that really despised marriage, and was very sexually promiscuous in a physical, visceral way that even our culture is not today. Beyond even that, as you read this chapter, and I did not include this, but you have in verse 26 of 1 Corinthians 7, this, this passage where Paul says, because of the present crisis, he's giving some of this advice. So there's something going on in the day that Paul is writing this that is causing some of what he's writing to be written. Now, we don't know exactly what the present crisis is. I've grown up in the church. I've heard a number of people address it. When you come and look at the commentaries, when we try to study historically what's going on, there are several things that might be happening. There's something real happening. It's just not clear that we can know exactly what it was. It's possible, for instance, that there was a massive famine going on. There was a famine around that time that caused many people, adults and children, to starve to death. But there was also, for instance, a prophecy going around, which actually took place in 70 AD, that Rome and Corinth would be destroyed. So as Paul gives some of this advice, and you can feel this, if you compare this, for instance, this chapter to other chapters, Paul speaks differently about some things. And he's doing so because there is a present crisis going on. And so today we're going to look a little bit at marriage and singleness. We're not going to look so much at sexuality. Chad did look at that last week. We're going to look at marriage and singleness. And I would simply say this to you. You never need to be careful about believing God's word, but you often need to be careful about how you stick it in people's faces. Because Paul is giving advice here around something we can't fully get our hands on. And I'm saying this to help you. It's not clear all that's going on here. So as a pastor speaks, we need to be careful. We want to dig at what's underneath what he's saying. We want to dig at the principles. And we don't want to go beyond. And let me say this before I jump in to what he's saying. Marriage does not work for all people. Even people who stay married. I cannot give you or me simple answers about the difficulty that is in marriage. Now, we all know people who are very happily married and who love their marriage, but we also know people who really struggle in marriage. And so I, as we talk about this, for some of you, this will be very painful. And I recognize that. I don't want to dodge what the text is saying. I don't want to dodge what the Bible is saying. But I want you to recognize that as we come to this passage, we must remember that we come as people coming to this table who need forgiveness and grace. And the glue that holds all marriages together is the glue of forgiveness and grace. So as we jump into this, I want to speak to some few of you who think, John, my marriage doesn't work. And I don't want you to hear me today going, oh, here's a simple answer for this. That's just not fair. But let's jump in today to this passage and see the call to marriage the call to singleness, and the call to repentance. That's our point today. In this passage, Paul is calling us to understand marriage and think about this pagan culture where they weren't married, where they had multiple sex partners, where that was the norm in the town square, and now he's calling them to marriage. And what Paul is teaching us in this is that the only appropriate place for sex is in marriage. So they've written him this question, and this is their question. It is good for a man not to have sexual relations with a woman. This is what the Corinthian church is asking Paul. Now you can immediately understand why they asked this question. They've been so inundated with sex. They've given themselves to sex so much. And they recognize this call to wholehearted allegiance to Jesus that they've decided, you know what, it would be better to just stop having sex. And so they've made this rule and they said it would be good, it's good for a man not to have sexual relationship with a woman. But Paul says, wait, wait, 
But since sexual immorality is occurring, each man should have sexual relations with his own wife and each woman with her own husband. Paul is teaching them something here, that the only appropriate place for sex is in marriage. He is saying, no, some of you need to have sex. You can't simply stop having sex. And he even qualifies this as he deals with unmarried men and women and those who've lost a spouse when he says later, it is better to marry than to burn with passion. Paul is not here saying that all sexual activity will be satisfying, but he is saying that for some people, they cannot turn away from sexual activity, and the place to do that is marriage. Most of you knew that before you got here. I recognize that. That's not new ground for you. But I think it's important that we say, and it's important that we understand that this idea has become less and less common in our day. That it is better to be married than to burn with pa- uh, than to burn with passion. But really, underneath this, Paul is getting at something else here. He, he's, he's really saying something else about marriage. We know that sexuality is reserved for marriage. He's saying that you are really to be married so that you will understand the work of Jesus Christ better. And he says something so strong here that this is what's hard for me to preach on, to be blunt. Preaching about sex, that can be fun and interesting. This part isn't. He says in verse 32, I would like you to be free from concern. An unmarried man is concerned about the Lord's fear, how he can please the Lord, but a married man is concerned about the affairs of this world, how he can please his wife, and his interests are divided. An unmarried woman or a virgin is concerned about the Lord's affairs. Her aim is to be devoted to the Lord in both body and spirit. Now, I want you to notice, he says, but a married woman is concerned about the affairs of this world, how she can please her husband. Both the man and the woman, Paul says, is if you get married, Your desire is to please your spouse. This is far, I mean, I I think all of you sit there and go, yeah, I kind of got that. I made him the brownies he asked for. (laughs) She asked for this, I bought it. And that somehow betrays the centrality of this idea that Paul talks about in Ephesians, that marriage is a unique picture of the work of Jesus Christ on behalf of his people. See, he doesn't just mean, oh, I made the brownies that he or she wanted. That's wonderful. He means this, that marriage is a place where you exchange your life for another person. That you come to this idea of marriage, and this is what he's getting at, to give yourself to each other, to consider the other's needs, and that this is the very essence of the work of Christ. In fact, he's saying underneath this passage, you come to marriage to discover the depth and the death of the cross. It is supposed to teach you how much God loves you. You're supposed to see in one another someone laying down their life for another person. And I want us to be careful, especially as evangelicals, that we don't sort of glibly look at marriage. The Bible does not believe, for instance, that marriage will make you happy. It believes that marriage will teach you to die, and in dying you'll find happiness. It doesn't believe that marriage will make you happy. It believes that it will call you to death. And in that death, you will find yourself and that it will ask you to die. It's teaching you that someone else is more important than you. As Paul contemplates the way he talks about this, his whole language in this passage is saying, you Corinthians, because you've grown up here, and he's being really empathetic, it may not feel, all you've thought about in terms of marriage is sexuality and that misses the point. Marriage is a place where we come to exchange our life for another person, to lay down our life for our friend, in this case, who's our spouse, to die to ourselves. Hear me say this. You cannot say to another person, I love you, unless you are losing your life for them. Your life is to be used up for another person. One of the blessings, I don't, I use that word carefully, in watching my mother and dad age, and as we help them move into a facility that has been really wonderful for them, honestly, 
has cared for them is watching the spouses of those who are there care for their dying spouses. Seeing men and women come in and sit with their spouse as their spouse's life is ebbing away, knowing that they're healthy, they could be, and these are glip, they could be out walking and smelling the dogwoods. They could be out playing tennis with a friend. They could be out eating lunch with a friend. But they've decided to come and to exchange their life for that person's life. They've decided to lay down their life for this other person. You see it in men and women pushing their spouse around. You see them in giving up their life on behalf of this other person. Now, you do it throughout your life. You just feel it and you can see it in those moments. See, Paul is saying if you sort of reduce marriage to sex, you've missed the entire point. Certainly, sex is an appropriate and only place to be done is in marriage. But he's saying something deep, deeper. The words, I love you, mean I give my life up for you both ways. I just want to say this for those who may be new to Christianity. Some of this is revolutionary. Paul is giving women rights they had nowhere else in that day, and certainly not in the town of Corinth. She had the right to own his body. He had the right to own her. Nowhere else was that practiced. And I just want to say to us as Christians, and I've not necessarily heard any of you say this, but I just know that it sort of floats in the Christian ether of, of what it means to be an evangelical in America. We need to be careful about the way we talk about marriage as Christians. Marriage is a good and beautiful thing, but it is not the best and only way to live for some people. Paul is going to talk here about the gift of marriage and the gift of singleness. And it's very easy for us to look at people who might be single and go, oh, I feel sorry for you. It's also easy to look at people and go, marriage will fulfill you. And I just want you to know that I love my wife deeply and would marry no one else, but it has killed and emptied me also. And her. In being married, neither of us meant to live in Tucson, and that can be a simple, funny thing. But we've given up a lot, right, to be together. Not only in terms of where we live, but who we are. This thing called marriage is a picture of the cross. And we have to stop implying that marriage is God's best plan to make people happy. It's God's best plan to kill you. It's God's best plan to help you sit at dinner just hungry and tired and to realize that you're the most selfish person on the face of the earth. That's his plan for marriage. There are wonderful and beautiful moments around vacations and walks and it's worth saying lovemaking and poetry and movie going and, and sitting. Yes, and... God keeps asking me, why won't you give your life up for Marissa? And I was like, because I don't want to. I want her to give her life up for me every day. Quickly, without discussion, without argument. But I'm not interested in doing it for her. Be careful, Christians, as we invite people into the most beautiful thing God has ever created, a picture of his marriage. It's not a casual thing. God is showing his love for us. It, marriage is sacred. It's a complete giving of ourselves, even our bodies to one another. And it's interesting, you see that this is going to be a rub with our culture where he says, your body didn't belong to you along, it doesn't belong to her along. He's saying language that our, our culture will not buy. Look, marriage is dying in the West and we're going to be the last bastion standing on the wall talking about it. Let's just talk about it well. It is a beautiful call to take up the cross and follow Jesus. And unless you see self-dying as part of it, you'll never understand sexuality and you'll never understand marriage. Which brings me to my second gift here, which is singleness. And some people and some of us who are married might go, I understand that, don't want to be married. And I want to caution us against using language like that's weird or what's wrong with them or what happened to them when we begin to talk about being single. 
Paul is in fact single in this passage. He says he is. He says, I wish that all of you were as I am without a wife. He probably had a wife at one point. He served on the Sanhedrin. You had to be married to be on the Sanhedrin. Whether he's given this advice because his wife left when he became a Christian or whether she died, or we have no idea. We just know that he's single. And Paul actually says, I, in verse 32, would like you to be free of concern. An unmarried man is concerned about the Lord's affairs, how he can please the Lord, but a married man is concerned about transmissions and flowers and birthday parties and swim meets and third grade math, how failing that will end the entire life of this child and his interests are divided. An unmarried woman or a virgin is concerned about the Lord's affairs. Her aim is devoted to the Lord in both body and spirit, but a married woman is concerned about the affairs of this world. Paul actually says this is a gift and some people can walk in it. Some people are called to be single. It's not weird or strange. It's a gift. Always remember this. Jesus was single. Jesus was single. He is the man that we all aspire to be. And at this point, Paul is single. And some people find themselves in the midst of singleness. And if you can navigate this, then you have an ability to serve God and to serve other humans in a way that married people don't. We need to be honest about this. You can please the Lord through being single. You, can, you have more time, more energy, more money, more everything for the Lord. And that's why we have to be careful that we don't create an atmosphere in any church that basically says the family is everything. Single people need to get a family to be involved. Singleness is a gift. It's a beautiful gift. We also need to recognize that people are single for different reasons. Some people are single because their spouse has died. Some people are single because their spouse chose to leave. Paul deals with this and says, when an, when an unsaved spouse wants to leave, you're free to let them go. And, and not everybody chooses to be that, but they still are single. And we need to recognize that. And I think we need to say this very carefully. We also need to recognize that there are now, even among us, certain Christians who are attracted to the same sex, we would call that homosexuality or being gay, who are choosing because of faith in Jesus Christ to fully follow Christ and to be celibate in order to serve God. That there are people who are born who are not attracted to the opposite sex, who choose singleness as a celebration of Christ's love for them, who do not practice their desires, who will be virgins when they die, who are offering their celibacy to Christ. We need to acknowledge that. That's a real thing in our culture. And yet what I would like us to see today is that singleness is a gift of God. It is not a malformity. It is not a problem. And it is not a mistake. I talked to one of you who will go unnamed but is my hero, who I asked once, have, having had their spouse, in this case, had died. I said, will you seek to be married again? They said, I did it once, and that was enough. It's not true for everybody. See, what Paul says is each man or woman has their own gift. And we must exercise that gift. But I want us to be careful that we're not a group of people who inadvertently tell singles, we don't know what to do with you. We're not sure about you. Because it is a gift of God. In my, uh, in my high school that I went to in South Carolina, Lugolf Elgin High School, we had a state championship track team. And they won something like, you know, 15 out of 18 state championships in track. And I, I, I wasn't paying attention until I was a senior. I, I did not run track and field. I'm not only slow, I can't jump and I can't throw. So that sort of left, you know, track and field is not an option for me. But I was sitting, they would make, I would help the track team by like keeping time or putting up hurdles or taking down hurdles. I was kind of a manager, just a helper, a lot of my friends. And uh, two track teams showed up one day for a track meet and they were kind of warming up. And the two coaches who had come to run there were talking. And uh, the two coaches, one of them said, you know, do you think we'll ever beat Luke off Elgin? And this is what the other coach said. Not until Coach Dingle gets married. <laughs> so Coach, that's really his name. Coach Dingle was our track coach. He was single. He's single to this day. And he decided he was going to have the best track team of all time. Uh, he did. He worked on track at 6 in the morning, at 7 in the morning. He taught from 8 to 2, and he worked on track from 2.30 to 10.30. You know what these other coaches had? They had a life. <laughs> and children. And responsibility. 
Coach Stiegel had the best track facility. He built it with his own hands. Lugolf didn't have enough money. He brought in the dirt. He put down the dirt. He put down the asphalt. He, like, he built it. You know why he did? Because he was single. It was beautiful. So many people got scholarships. So many people love him. Look, it's just true that the gift of singleness enables people to do stuff that married people can't. And that's a good thing. It's bad if you're a tra- an opposing track coach, but it's a good thing. This singleness is something that God gives as a gift. Stop imposing your insecurities onto single people. When you look at them and say, how do you do it? They know and you don't. And that's okay. They have that gift. Some are very happy to be single, very. Just because you cannot imagine it, living in that way, doesn't mean you should make fun of it or challenge it. The single may be looking right back across the table at you thinking, I feel so sorry for you. (laughs) Right? They may be. Look, Make room for singles in what you do as Christians. As you run your community groups, as you're in a men's small group or a women's small group, please don't let every conversation be about your children and grandchildren. Please. Can we please talk about something else once in a while? Can we please ask about their lives and get involved in their lives? Can we create a space for people whose spouse has, is, never was or who's passed away? Because they have a full, rich life of serving Jesus that it's worth us investigating. And unless we really make room for them, they will not have a place in the church. It is hard for a single to connect to a married. That's true. But it takes work and effort. One of the things you need to do to connect your single friends is you need to find a mission together. One of the things we're pushing things like City Serve is that's a place where we leave our children, our jobs behind, and we go serve side by side in a common cause. And that's where friendship can be. So please make room. Singleness is a beautiful thing. Which brings me to my last point. His point here is that we need to repent about where we've been as both married and single people. We need to embrace the gift we have. Paul's real focus here, and I didn't skip it, is he would like us to be content. He's saying to those Corinthians, hey, I know that you've been sexually active this way in your town, and now you need to become content in marriage. And he's saying to the married person, you need to be content in your marriage, and the single person, you need to be content in your singleness because these are God's gifts. And he says, he says it this way, and this is really the heart of chapter 7. It's really not about sexuality. It's about contentment. What I mean, brothers and sisters, is that the time is short, This goes back to him thinking something is changing. From now on, those who have wives should live as if they do not. Those who mourn as if they did not. Those who are happy as if they were not. Those who buy something as if it were not theirs to keep. Those who use the things of this world as if not engrossed with them. For this world in its present form is passing away. But he says finally in verse 35, in addition to that, I am saying this for your own good, not to restrict you, but that you may live in a right way, in undivided devotion to the Lord. See, what he's really inviting us to in chapter 7 is a life of deep commitment and, I'm sorry, contentment. He's saying what it means to be a Christian is to embrace the gift you have, to embrace the marriage you have. The next one won't be better. I'm serious. 85% of people who leave a spouse and marry again get divorced again. The single person may often look across the table and think, I long for a spouse. And God is saying, you don't need a spouse right now. Embrace the gift you have. Part of what is true about our hearts is that the other thing always looks more appealing than the thing we have. You know how I know this? Because I hang out with a lot of golfers and they all own a hundred putters. So a putter, a putter is the thing you hit on the green and we're convinced that the next putter will make us putt better. Here's the trouble with the next putter. I'm still holding it. It's not the putter, it's the putty. See, part of what Paul is commending to us here in different ways is that we have to embrace our own emptiness. Marissa Stone cannot fill up some of the emptiness that is in me because of sin and is in me because of who I am. 
Another human being cannot redeem me. I cannot redeem myself. I cannot bring rest and calm to my own soul, and sometimes neither can Marissa. The pressure we're putting on other people to fix us and to heal us is killing the very relationships that we long for. See, contentment in Christ is Paul's solution in this chapter to rampant sexuality out of control, to marriages that feel empty, and to singleness that feels lost. He is calling us to a deep commitment, not in our spouse, but in him. He is asking us to find in him the place where we rest. The best gift that you can give your children or can give your spouse or can give your roommate or your friend is contentment in the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul says it somewhere else. I'm not saying this because I am in need, for I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. But I've learned the secret of being content in any situation, both in need and plenty, And that is this, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Paul is asking us to have an identity that is rooted in Christ and not rooted in singleness or marriage or our Corinthianism or our Americanism, but to be rooted in who he is and there and there alone is their contentment. And really what he's wanting us to learn is that we are to lift our eyes and worship and say, there's Christ. He is enough for me. We were, uh, we did a new members class this weekend. It was a lot of fun. And one of our, several of our participants had little children. One of our participants had a little, a little tiny baby, about eight months old. And this baby just wouldn't let anyone else hold her. And this can happen, right? Maybe it's the smell of the mother or the feel of the mother's arms. But it was interesting to watch us all take a chance at being the one that could comfort this baby. We were 0 for 6. There were six people who tried at different times to take. And she would push at your face and cry and look at her mother. But the image I'd like you to hold on to, because you can see this image everywhere, is when we did hand that baby to her mother. She rolled over and she sucked her thumb and she went to sleep. Now you know what that baby doesn't have is any ability to feed itself, any ability to dress itself, any ability to transport itself, any ability to do anything. All the baby has the ability to do is to go, I trust the smell of this one. This is the one I can trust. This is the one that'll feed me. This is the one that'll feed, that'll that'll clothe me. This is the one that'll fill me. This is the one that'll protect me. And in that moment, there's real contentment. Stop asking your spouse and your job and your country to be Jesus. Let Jesus be Jesus. Find contentment in him. Let me pray for him. Lord, we thank you for these words in 1 Corinthians 7. What a beautifully powerful, strange chapter. And yet these words are for us, not just for them. So give us the mercy um, to really understand our marriage and our singleness but more importantly to understand our need for contentment in you because you're all that we need. And we ask this, Jesus, for your name's sake. Amen. We come now to the table of the Lord where he set before us his bread and his wine. We did notice last week, and there may be some of you who are just coming back, that some of you left the bread in the top. I recognize that all of our fingers don't work well, but you can peel the top off to get the bread and then peel it back to get the wine for sure. So just know that if you can't ask a neighbor to help you, ask them this question first, have you been vaccinated? Yes, can you peel the top off for me? (laughs) And get to the bread. But Jesus has set before us his body and blood, which by faith we're gonna eat of now because what's represented is Christ's death here. And as Christians, we come to eat and drink from his body and blood and so be strengthened. And if you're not a Christian today, We'd invite you just to watch because it's not that we would like to exclude you. It's just just that this is a testimony that we're believers in Jesus as the Son of God, the only Savior of mankind. But if indeed you are a Christian this week, we invite you to come. Because on the night he was betrayed, Jesus took bread, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is broken for you. Eat this as often as you do so in remembrance of me. And he also took a cup and said, This cup represents a new covenant made in my blood. For the forgiveness of sins of many, drink this as often as you do so 
in remembrance of me. Let's take a few seconds to prepare for this meal. Amen. Christians, we break bread in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and we proclaim the great mystery of our faith. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. We thank God for these gifts. The body of Christ is broken for you to eat with great joy. Peel back those tops. The blood of Christ also was poured out for us. It is our great joy. Drink with great joy. Let's stand for the benediction. If you hold your palms up and your heads up, we'll receive a word from Jesus Christ. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you. May you find in Jesus Christ what's actually there, your true self and true contentment. Go in peace. Amen.